And citizens also begin to worry about the fact that there is growing social inequality. Today, the 1% richest Americans, as you know, account for 60% of the wealth in this nation and more than 60% of the consumer spending, which is you know, mind-boggling when you think about it. Uh, and that, act, of course, leaves a lot of people left out of the system. Uh, for example, many of you may or not know that there are you know, 68 million, that's about 70 million people, that's one-fifth of the US population, which is unbanked or underbanked. They don't have access to a debit card, credit card, or a saving account that we may take for granted. Right? So that's a big, you know, think about that as a market potentially, right? That's the size of the French population. Huge market to be tapped right here in our back door. Um, and you look at Europe, same thing, uh, 50 million people who live with very low income. Uh, so that's a situation that is getting worse as well in Europe. Um, so this is also creating a need now for citizens to try to consume products and services that actually you know, meet the tight budget. Uh, and also think boldly, how do we look at these people not as poor people, but potentially as a market that could be served with the right business model? And we'll talk about that in a few slides. So citizens also worry about you know, the environment. Uh, and especially in California, as you know, uh, water shortage is gonna become a huge problem. Uh, you know, when I came here seven years ago, we were hinting at it, but suddenly I think it's becoming increasingly clear that you know, we have to learn to do more with less, uh, especially because California, as you know, is the fifth largest food producer in the world, so we have to learn to produce more with less water. Uh, so all this is leading to an interesting uh, you know, attitude among consumers who are saying that 55% um, say, I'm willing to even pay some extra money for those brands that are socially and environmentally responsible, and two-thirds of them many of them, Generation Y and Z, want to work for companies that are also socially and environmentally responsible. So it means that the consumers are also becoming what I call values conscious, and they want the products they buy actually embody those values as well. So as a result, what we begin to see emerge is what I call a frugal economy. This is an economy where, interestingly, the citizens are becoming more empowered with new technologies, new social media platforms, and they're becoming what we call prosumers. Instead of being passive users of your product and services, they start producing themselves the product and services they need, either alone or as part of a community. And they're using two pillars to build this frugal economy. The first pillar is around sharing, and the other one is around the making. I'm sure that you're familiar with both, but I just want to kind of touch upon quickly. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer sharing, as you know, with things like Airbnb and, uh, and um, whether it's crowdfunding, or whether it's uh, you know, uh, apartment sharing or car sharing, is really gonna explode only in the next 10 years. Uh, PwC you know, sizes the market uh, to grow from about $15 billion today to $335 billion within 10 years. Uh, and this is, by the way, the tip of the iceberg. This is the B2C sharing, where us citizens share our apartment and cars. Imagine what happens when companies begin to share assets. And what happens if you create the next platform, the next Airbnb for companies Right, the next Uber for companies, and we'll talk about that as well. That's going to be trillions of dollars. Okay, so there's a big, you know, B2B sharing economy emerging as well. We'll talk about that. But this is the tip of the iceberg, the B2C side, and what is amazing is, of course, it's growing by leaps and bounds simply because the folks who are building the platforms have an unfair advantage. Uh, today, Airbnb is the fifth largest hotel chain in the world without having a single hotel in the balance sheet. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're growing, as you see, very quickly. As Brian Chesky says, Marriott wants to add 30,000 rooms. Uh, we will do that in two weeks. Uh, Marriott wants to have one million hotel rooms, I think, by 2020. Uh, Airbnb will have it by end of 2015. <laughs> so that's the speed at which you know, uh, they can scale up very quickly. Um, and this is growing more in Europe. I know that in the US, you're very familiar with it, but I think Europe is way ahead in terms of you know, adopting the sharing economy. With uh, especially in the car sharing, which is you know with the platforms like Blah Blah Car, which is Europe's largest uh, car sharing platform. Um, so this is really happening. This is you know essentially citizens saying instead of you know buying a car, I want to actually share a car, right? Uh, especially among young people, this trend you know is more pronounced. 
But the real phenomenon is going to be the maker movement, as you know very well. Uh, this is something that began here in San Mateo, interestingly, so right place to be, uh, as a maker fair in uh, 2006. Um, and today it has grown in sophistication, especially with uh, new technologies like you know, 3D printing that is becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, and what is really driving this maker movement, in my opinion, are the building blocks that are going to be almost like the, the digital railways of the knowledge economy, if you like. Uh, these are some of them. You may be familiar with them. Uh, the left end, it's a Raspberry Pi, which I brought here. Uh, this is a, a personal computer the size of a credit card that cost about 30 bucks, and uh, 5 million people have downloaded it now to create their own devices. You know? so, so this is like a building block for creating any kind of electronic device you want, which before used to cost a lot of money, but today is being democratized. On the right hand side is our donor chip, which again cost, I believe, about 30, 35 bucks which is a microcontroller, and that is being used by over one million developers today. So this is going to be the building blocks, if you like, for you know, creating the kind of uh, uh, frugal devices that used to cost a fortune you know, a couple of years ago. And then you have, of course, these platforms like TechShop and Fab Labs, we call it in Europe, which are also becoming the venue where you can start creating some really cool applications, uh, such as Square, which came out from uh, TechShop, actually. Uh, today, of course, is famous, but uh, at the beginning, uh, Jim McKelvey, who actually launched it uh, with uh, Jack Dorsey, actually went to Tech Shop to prototype it. Uh, and the, when they went to the VCs to present their, uh, their business model, they were all rejected in Sand Hill. Um, but then when they went back and they showed the prototype of what they're developing, they ended up raising $10 million. <laughs> Uh, and the message is essentially, uh, for you entrepreneurs, I call Tech Shop the place where you can help reduce your time to credibility. We talk about time to market. Time to credibility is when you go to VC, how can you quickly make your solution credible? Right? And the more you can compress it by creating actual prototypes, the faster you can raise the money. Because before we couldn't do it, right? Because humans are visuals, so the more they can see um, it's more likely the VC will ask you technical questions on how to improve your prototype, but it will be hard pressed to shoot down your business model because you show that you can create a product, a real one, right, as a prototype. Uh, so that's really what's happening. A lot of uh, hardware startups are being launched with a PO box in a tech shop now. <laughs> uh, and uh, so this is one of them, which is a square. Um, and the next one is uh, this product. Some of you may have heard about it. It's called Embrace. Um, this is actually uh, launched by four students from uh, Stanford University who actually developed this in a tech shop. Uh, essentially, this is, looks like a mini sleeping bag. Um, actually, this is for premature babies, and when they are born, you have to keep them at constant temperature. Um, so in the West, we put them in what we call an incubator. An uh, incubator costs about $20,000 and requires electricity. So not really viable option in developing countries like in the villages in India or Africa. So this solution essentially simply uses this material inside. It's called a phase change material. It looks like, uh, like wax. And essentially you can melt it by putting it on a heating pad or in boiling water. And then you reinsert it inside. And then it can actually keep the baby warm at constant temperature for six hours straight. Okay. And the solution cost uh, $200, which is 1% of the cost of incubators sold you know, in the West. And uh, amazingly, um, they have already saved the lives of 160,000 babies around the world with this very simple solution. Uh, and again, this is frugal because they didn't require a big lab <laughs> to you know, prototype and develop the first version of it. They did it in a tech shop, and then they went to India to actually launch a real company that today you know, serves you know, multiple markets around the world. And Jane Chen, the co-founder of the solution, uh, was invited to the White House um, to show a solution to President Obama, who actually hosted the first Maker Fair in the White House in June last year. And he said famously that uh, today's DIY is tomorrow's made in America. Uh, he has actually in his cabinet a senior advisor who is helping him think about how to turn this maker movement from something from hobbyists and amateurs into a, you know, a real economic force as well. So you can begin to see that you know, this is not some kind of you know, uh, amateurish thing happening you know, uh, here and there. There is a real movement building, you know, building up behind it. 